Good afternoon. We are live on NBS and we are celebrating the 90 days of oil and mining. This afternoon is a very special session and it's going to basically focus on young people. I have a very interesting panel with me here this afternoon. We have Awu Somkwama from UNDP, Kwamea from UNB, UNDP here, and we have Alex Diamokama from Petroleum Authority. We also have Joel Bamwise from Stanbeck Business in Chubenta, and then lastly we have Oscar Mohomuza from Uganda Petroleum Authority. We are going to start with Wilson. You, as you know, the youth have been very excited about oil and gas. They want to know how can they access the opportunities. And of course, what UNDP is doing, I know that you have a youth business facility. Can you tell us about it? And I know after that, people will be able to appreciate what you've been doing and then also be able to hear more from the rest. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, as you know, uh, the youth in Uganda constitute a very big majority. Over 80% of the population is under the age of 30. Yes. And we also, about 30% of, of, uh, between 18 and 35, that's the youth. So we have the youth, 18 to 35, 30%. Therefore, these youth provide a big opportunity for the country in terms of development. However, this, the potential is undermined by the fact that there are limited opportunities for, for employment. These youths, uh, when they are not employed, they pose significant risk. Therefore, it is important for the government and various development partners to be able to work together to create employment opportunities for these youth. Yes. Uh, these youth face a number of challenges, and one of them is lack of access to financial services. Because of the lack of unemployment, many have tried to move into entrepreneurship into business skills. However, the challenge is they lack access to financial services, they lack access to knowledge, business skills, entrepreneurial skills, and a whole host of things. Yes. So how, what is this youth business facility that yes. you're doing as UNDP? I'm coming to it. Okay. Therefore, government has partnered. Sorry, there's need for, first of all, there's a need for government yes. to partner with various different partners and the private sector to be able to address the issue of unemployment. Therefore, UNDP, uh, in partnership with the Stanbic Bank Holdings, have come together and developed an innovative facility, mm. which we call the Youth for Business and Innovation and Entrepreneurship Facility. Mm. Uh, it is aimed at providing, uh, at pro at, at providing resources, mm. okay? resources for the youth. Mm. And this uh, facility has three components in it. One of the components is the enterprise challenge. Is the, is the, is the, is the, the, first, the first component is the innovative challenge uh, facility. This one is uh, a fund that has been put together to, to provide resources to spur the youth to engage and develop innovative uh, business models that can spur uh, growth and entrepreneurship. The second one is the Enterprise Challenge uh, Fund. This one is for, again, for enter is, is for also for entrepreneurs and the youth especially to, to come in and provide uh, resources through blended financing. Blended financing is a, is a mixture of uh, award grants and concessional loans. Mm. Now, uh, they will, they will partner with Stanbic Bank to provide these resources to be able to, pro, to finance business models that offer impacts at scale. Mm. Yes. And then the third component is the ecosystem, innovative ecosystem mm. uh, platform. The platform is supposed to provide a, a mechanism for the youth and micro and small enterprises, medium small enterprises, mm. to be able to be able to come together, share knowledge, uh, discuss issues, mm. uh, dialogue with government, to be able to have more knowledge and also be able to expand the, the networks so the, as, a, as, a, as a way of, again, ensuring 
that we will, we will be able to expand the businesses. So if, there are three windows. If I'm a young person yes. and I'm into, uh, let's say, uh, shoemaking, and yes. I have a challenge and I want to expand my business, mm. and I, I, I get to Stanbic Bank to access the Enterprise Challenge Fund, mm. what kind of support will I get? Okay. And how much? And what is required? Okay. First of all, uh, this fund, uh, we are able to provide up to US dollars, 40,000 okay. uh, US dollars. 40,000 is about 120 million. Yes, 140, one, 140, which, is, which is okay for about a About 140 million. Okay. It is a competitive matching grant. Yes. Uh, this money is a matching grant mm. and it's competitive, you know, which means you have to provide some contribution to it. Yes, <coughs> yes, okay? I do understand. And um, we have been advertising it mm. through uh, calls, call for proposals. Okay. So if you go to Stanley Bank, you will get the information where you'll be led to apply. Mm. We have advertised this call for proposals mm. uh, in various uh, media. For instance, we have advertised on uh, the social media platforms for Stanley Bank, for UNDP. We have adv advertised also on the websites for UNDP. We have also, we are also gone ahead to working to do road shows because there are some of those who may not be uh, IT sub survey yes. and they need to access it. So we are working with Sun Bank to organize road shows, to go out to the districts and sensitize the district commercial, of commercial officers uh, and the district and, and, the, and, the, the, and the, 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 the community development officers so that they can be able to provide information to the youth who may want to be involved. In I wanted success. to ask you a question, who is a young person? Because, you know, I have seen people who are at 50 standing for youth member of parliament. So what do you yes. mean by a youth? <laughs> so that we are able to, yes. in this <laughs> we are able to determine who will be really qualified. In this category, yes. uh, the youth are between the ages of 18 yes. and 35 years. Okay. However, this uh, facility is, is um, the people who are eligible are the youth. Yes. Youth-owned enterprises. Yes. And also medium and small enterprise firms yes. that uh, provide opportunities for the youth to engage. Okay, okay. So even non-youth yes. who are engaged in enterprises yes. that support or promote uh, businesses and the youth employment and creation are also eligible. So as I end with you, I wanted to understand if I wanted to walk in Stanbic right now, mm. can I access the fund or I need to wait for a call for proposal? You cannot access the fund directly. Yes. What yeah. you will do, you will access the information yes. that we talked about. Yes. Right now, we have an ongoing call for proposals. Okay. okay. And therefore, you can be able to get the information. It's right. still open? Yeah, it is still Meaning open. guys who are watching NBS yes, at the it moment... Open. I'm really calling yes. upon you we to apply. Also, yeah, we also we also have uh, we, we we also do uh, webinars. Okay. okay. And uh, there is the next webinar is the 18th November. Okay. okay. So you, where we provide information, yes. especially for those who want to apply, we give them more information. We respond to their questions, and therefore, that is available. Thank you very much, yes. uh, Wilson from UNDP. Thank you. I think we are going to get to our next uh, person, Joel, from the Stanbic Incubator. Uh, Joel, what is the Stanbic Incubator? Thank you so much uh, for having, having me and uh, having us here. Uh, it's a privilege to speak to the country about the Stanbic Business Incubator and what we do. Um, the easiest way to explain the Stanbic Business Incubator is to say it is a sister to the bank because people understand the bank much better. Uh, I will not divulge into the details of how we are part of the holding company of Stambic Holdings Uganda. Mm -hmm. But look at us as, uh, whereas the bank would give you the finances, we prepare you to utilize those finances. So we are moving away from just a bank that gives you loans and forgets. We want to prepare the people who are accessing any sort of financing to, to, to give them the necessary skills to run businesses that will scale from the finances that they give. So the Stambic Business Incubator is mandated mm -hmm. to prepare and train SMEs to build the capacities of SMEs to grow, uh, give them all the necessary skills they need uh, for growth of revenue, creation of jobs, and of, uh, of that matter, uh, excel and, and scale uh, beyond just Uganda. But how does it fit in the context of oil and mining? 
Well, we, we stand out very strong um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense that we established ourselves. Of course, there is the, uh, I like my, my colleague uh, who runs the, the, the Chigumba Petroleum uh, Place, which is the, the mainstream academia for the oil and gas. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, for those of you who will not be able to go through the official paperwork uh, or the official petroleum uh, college, you will come to the business incubator. Because then we are positioned ourselves as the entity that prepares you for the industry, to benefit from the industry. Uh, there is no other uh, in that way. Apart from, as I said, the, the, the mainstream academia, the Stambic Business Incubator prepares your company to benefit from the oil and gas industry. Now, and I want to understand, Joel. Yes. If today I say I have a business mm -hmm. and I have, let's say, a, a manufacturing, a, a fruit processing plant, a very small one, as a young person, what kind of support would you give me if I come to the incubator? The support you'd give, um, uh, you would get for that matter is from, we receive companies uh, mm -hmm. all over the country now. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, uh, the first year that we established, we are now in the third year, mm. uh, we were only concentrating on Kampala and particularly the oil and gas uh, companies uh, that are related in that, in that chain. Mm. Uh, we, that would run from uh, logistics and mm. transport, uh, mm. uh, fabrication, mm. uh, people in the construction, because these were the mainstream that the oil and gas uh, industry demanded for. We have since expanded that scope to include various companies. Now, you might be in the manufacturing industry. Now, very many companies in Uganda are small and steadily small. Mm -hmm. Forget those that die before they see their second birthday. They are those that are alive, but they are just very small. Yes. You come to the incubator, we give you the necessary skills to expand, mm -hmm. to grow beyond being a small supplier to being a contractual supplier. Mm -hmm. My colleague will, uh, uh, will mention, uh, will speak into this, Alex, when, uh, when he gets a chance to speak, mm. of the oil and gas industry does not play in the small league, let me mm. call it that way. Mm. We are now playing, allow me to borrow the word, in a mm. Champions League, mm. which then requires companies to be formal. Mm. You cannot mm. just wake up one day and then you are supplying Total mm. or Unoc for that matter. Yeah. There have to be processes that are in place. Mm. You must be, of course, fully registered. Mm. Your products must be certified. There are quality assurances that must be in place. Mm. And this is what the Stambic Business Incubator is offering to the country and to the companies that are out there. We prepare them from typical business management mm. to contract management, bid management, quality assurance. Mm. All that we are preparing the companies so that they are in position to compete favorably. Otherwise, we might have a solution, uh, I mean, a situation where. Mm. It is only international companies that are registered in Uganda that are then again benefiting from the oil and gas industry. Mm. We so don't want this to be uh, the common thing of the cars of the oil, yeah. uh, but, but rather that we shall benefit as, uh, as a country and as SMEs in the local system. Joel, I wanted our audience to really understand yes. what I'll get from the incubator for Stanbeck Bank. Is it that when I come into the incubator, you give me free working space, you give me an advisor to handhold me? Is it that I would have support in registering my business? I really want you to, uh, to just provide more details about that. What will I get if I walk in? I'm 20 years of age. I want to be a fabricator, start my mm -hmm. business. I'm into the incubator. What support will you give us? Our package is too big that, uh, that, 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 that I'm... You just, have the uh, time. You have the time. That, that I'm struggling to, 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 to put it down. <laughs> when you apply to the Stambic Business Incubator, you attain training. Yes. Now, in the past, before COVID came, these were all physical trainings that were going on. Yes. And uh, for the past uh, two years, we have trained over 700 SMEs mm. that have gone through our system. Yes. And this has been training. But our training is blended. Mm. It is not just mainstream. Uh, whereas we work with industry experts uh, in these matters, mm. it is beyond just uh, the, 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 the classroom training. We provide coaching and follow up after that. But... Mm. Effective this year, we have, of course, moved online. We have a, a, a very robust LMS system, learning management system. Yeah. And even as I speak now, classes are going on mm. where people are learning and studying from wherever they are. But in addition to that, Madam Cynthia, we, uh, as, 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 as Mr. Wilson mentioned, we, have, we are all over the country now in every district. As I speak, even now we're on the third, uh, this is the third day of the regional trainings across the country. We are... As a, uh, we have training in Imbarara going on right now. 
We have training in Guru and training in Imbari. And now these are, uh, according to SOPs, these are small physical trainings that are going on mm -hmm. for the people in those regions. Mm -hmm. And we are building them from business management um, uh, to, uh, to all sorts of financial management and the like. But after these, uh, after the five days of mainstream training, they will be visited at their premises by standard certified coaches who will support them in applying what they have learned mm. um, so that then it is useful and, uh, um, uh, and that it works for them in their particular businesses. Joe, thank you very much. That was about the Stanbeck incubator. Now we are going to Alex. Alex is from the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Now, Ugandans, we are so excited about oil when it came. And there has been this slogan and jargon about local content and the various opportunities within the sector. Can you take us through what is local content and what opportunities are available for the Ugandans and especially the young people for in the sector? Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, our viewers. Uh, thank you for that very good uh, question. Local content or national content has been talked about you know, over and over again, mm. um, particularly in the oil and gas um, sector. Mm. Essentially, local content is, is, is about uh, supporting Ugandans participate in the oil and gas sector. Mm. And uh, I would just like to give a small overview mm. on the oil and gas sector, especially for the youth out there mm. who might not have as much information as probably a different category of people. Just to give context on where we are and the magnitude of the sector, and that feeds into the opportunities that we'll talk about. Uh, currently, we are segmented into different categories. There's, a, there's the exploration um, category where we have uh, two oil companies, mm -hmm. that is Oranto uh, Petroleum and AMA. They're involved in exploration, and we hope that they'll be able to get to a point where they are able to land on commercially uh, viable uh, reserves. Then we have projects that are progressing into the development uh, phase, and those projects are spearheaded by uh, Total and uh, Sinoc. Uh, Talo has just uh, farmed out, like you probably are aware. So those two projects are the ones, are now the flagship projects, where lots of opportunities that we'll talk about uh, actually are. So those are moving into development phase, and there's going to be a lot of uh, construction activities, and uh, a lot of demand for goods and services, and yes, opportunities for employment. And then we also have the other aspect of the commercialization uh, uh, activities or mm. infrastructure, mm. because eventually when oil is, 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 is drilled out of the ground, then you have to have where to put it. Mm. So we have uh, the East African crude oil pipeline uh, that runs from Kabale in Hoima to Tanga in Tanzania. That's a distance of about 1,443 kilometers. It's a heated, it's a heated pipeline and probably the longest heated pipeline in the world. So we'll also have um, the refinery. We'll have a 60,000 barrel per day refinery where we'll have uh, crude refined for you know, our own uh, local consumption and the other products that will be available uh, in the market. So, and all that, those activities and the investment that we expect to, you know, feed into that kind of investment, rather activities, ranges between 15 to 20 billion U.S. dollars. Mm. Now, that, that actually sinks in, because that, that shows you the magnitude of the project, which translates into the opportunities. Mm. Now, the youth out there, how would they come in? I mean, how would they participate and yeah. benefit from all these projects? Mm. Um, broadly, really, they are two broad categories of opportunities where the youth can come in, yes. either be employment uh, opportunities or provision of uh, goods and services. Mm -hmm. We've had my colleague uh, Wilson talk about uh, the finding opportunities. Mm -hmm. Stan Beek has talked about how they build capacity. Yes. Now, you, after building uh, your capacity and you've got in, uh, the funding that you need, how do you come in to probably play in the sector and provide mm -hmm. goods and services? We have what we call the National Supplier Database. Mm. Uh, that's the flagship system for the PAU, where we register companies that uh, intend to supply um, oil and gas. Mm. Uh, it's an online system that is very easily accessible. And from very easy for a young person very easy. whose business is not you know, so big 
It might not have all the requirements. Yes, that's why Stanbic is there. That's why it's to, to build you, uh, build your capacity. So and Stanbic yes. is facilitating registration on the national database for SMEs. We are working very closely with PAO in this matter. Yes. Okay, do you have an idea of how many businesses for young people have been registered on the we system? Have, we have about 1, 000, close to 1,800 uh, businesses mm -hmm. that are registered. But for uh, young people, how many? For, for, for young people, that at the moment is still a small uh, segment. Mm. And that is why we're working closely with um, Stanbic Bank, yes. uh, particularly the business incubator mm. and the other different stakeholders to have an, a conversation, engage with the youth, uh, see how they can come in, how they can build capacity. So if I'm a young person, yes. educated, not educated, staying in Kampala, Hoima, Masaka, Gulu, what can I get? What is there for me? This is what people need to understand. What am I getting from this big thing, the oil and gas yes. sector? We're actually getting there. So when it comes to provision of goods and services, yeah. of course we'll have uh, tier one contractors, those are big contractors, yes. that will be involved uh, in, in, in construction of, yes. big, of the big projects. But again, they require subcontracting, smaller packages, smaller components mm. of, uh, of works and service. And we know there are youth who have set up their small businesses, okay? Mm. And what we do, like I mentioned, we keep on reaching out to them, uh, having Sanbi uh, come on board, uh, build their capacity, and go to the different areas. We've had uh, campaigns to help register these businesses mm -hmm. on, on the NSD, because for you to be able to participate, companies usually look at the NSD. So we've had uh, visits to the different parts of the country. We camp in an area, uh, the youth come, uh, we go through their documents, uh, of their, uh, what they present for their businesses, help them register onto the national supplier database. That is one of the options. The other, the other aspect is on uh, employment. Mm. Um, my brother here mentioned that, yes, oil and gas is, is, a, is a highly specialized sector. Mm. And we know that uh, the opportunities that are largely there are for technical skill sets, mm. okay? The kind of uh, the welders, the likes of, uh, you know, electric, electricians, uh, pipe fitters. Mm. Now, those are skills, if, if, if you look at these skills, they are skills that are commonly, you know, with the youth. Mm. And there are a number of interventions that have been, uh, again, uh, undertaken by both government and then uh, the other partners, the development partners, mm. and the private sector in terms of skilling. We have had training of um, welders, mm. particularly the youth. The oil companies have been involved in training uh, welders to equip them with those skills mm. that they will require to be able to participate in the sector and, you know, get these opportunities. We have also helped them to register on what we call the National Oil and Gas Talent Register. Mm. Now, this one is different from the NSD that, or the National Supply Database that we talked about. Mm. This one essentially takes stock of the talent of the people who are interested to work in oil and gas sector and have the skills. So after training you, uh, you have been certified uh, through UPIC, mm. through other um, trade institutions, then we get you on board on the National Oil and Gas uh, Talent Register, which gives you exposure to lots of opportunities. Now, Alex, yes. you've talked about the supply register. I want to understand what can a young person supply <coughs> in the sector? Thank what you. are those things? Because sometimes when people are listening, to, I know we have so many people who are watching and they want to understand what can I supply? in the oil and gas sector. What are those things that young people can supply and they can be motivated to say, I need to register, go to the register and have my company there? Thank you so much, mm. uh, Ruth. Um, lots of services. Uh, if you go to the regulations, for instance, mm. there are 16 services that have been played a ring first mm. for Ugandan, yes. for Ugandans or Ugandan yes. companies. Yes. And among those services are, you know, services like catering. I know a number of youth who are involved in catering uh, businesses, the, the security, mm -hmm. security employees, a lot of youth, mm -hmm. okay, in terms of guarding and in terms of other security installations, yes. a lot of youth are employed in there. That is also a ring first um, service. Okay. We have supply of construction materials. Mm -hmm. We know youth, especially in the Albert and Graben, there are youth who have, um, who, who's, who, who have uh, like quarries mm -hmm. and have been involved in uh, bricklaying, uh, mining of stones which are essentially used in the construction activities, and they've been able to, 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 to benefit. So see, those are some of the services that the youth can actually uh, you know, participate in. We also have a bit of human resource. That is also a tech survey system, and I know that the youth uh, tech survey people in terms of recruitment, in terms of mm -hmm. coming up with systems mm -hmm. that help in recruitment and uh, 
deployment of different skill sets in the sector. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, the Petroleum Authority, for what you're doing. I want to get to your pick. Uh, Oscar. Yes, sir. The world, Ugandan, have heard so much about Chigumba. You pick Chigumba. I think everybody knows about it. It's the first, I think, one of the first institutions to train in oil and gas. And we need to really understand this. Where, where, where is Chigumba located, by the way? Thank you, Ruth. Um, it is like a bone when we say Chigumba. Is it a bone or? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Chigumba is on the Kampala Gulu Highway. Yes. Uh, about 200 kilometers. Okay. And uh, Yupik is situated about three kilometers off Chigumba town. Mm -hmm. um, to begin with, allow me to really say thank you to the Chamber of Mines and Petroleum yes. for these 90 days of oil and mining. Mm. Uh, it's been uh, a tremendous experience uh, in enlightening Ugandans about, they've practically brought the oil and gas industry live to all Ugandans who have been speculating and doubting whether uh, the oil is really there. Mm. I know power has done a lot of work, but the, the, this drive has really made a difference. Now, having said that, Uganda Petroleum Institute, Chigumba, is a public institution mm. uh, which was established in 2019 mm. as a, a result of uh, a pres uh, presidential directive, 2009, as a result of a presidential directive. Mm. Uh, the vision of government at the time was to domesticate oil and gas training. Of course, this was a new industry. We did not have a local institution that had a curriculum that would address the needs of this industry. And uh, since then, government has really committed a lot of resources. For the last um, eight years, I think uh, every year the institute uh, gets about 4.1 billion towards uh, uh, capital development. And in addition to that, uh, we are beneficiaries of the Albertine Region Sustainable Development Pro uh, Project which has a, a component that is supposed to uh, boost and upgrade uh, training institutions, particularly TVET. Uh, TVET is Tekken Core Vocation Education Training. And so, um, under the ARSDP, that's the Albertine project, uh, UPIC is a designated center of excellence in oil and gas training. And uh, what does it take to become uh, a center of excellence. One, you have to have the quality infrastructure that is up to the global uh, status. You have to have curriculum that is recognized internationally. And then you have to have the skilled people and qualified to deliver the curriculum. So this project has basically uh, helped us to achieve all these three. And as we speak, uh, we, we have infrastructure that is adequate to keep the training going on, but by February next, uh, next year, we will have four fully equipped state-of-the-art, uh, probably the best in Eastern Central Africa, because what the little we have is already good, but then we are getting better. So, in a, and, and this was designed together with industry. That's a very important factor, because we are training for industry, and whatever we do, we develop alongside with the industry stakeholders. So uh, we are getting there in terms of equipment. Uh, we are already there in terms of curriculum because we have uh, about five accredited programs uh, that we developed with assistance from a twinning partner. That is the French Petroleum Institute, IFP. Uh, so we, we had a curriculum developed that is directly mapped to the curriculum that the oil and gas industries understand. Mm. So didn't we have artisans or technicians in the country or engineers? Yes, definitely we did. But uh, does our national qualification framework speak to the needs of the international market? Uh, there was, uh, particularly for the oil and gas industry being new, this was lacking. And so that's how we come in to develop curriculum mm. and get accreditation by international accrediting bodies like City and Guilds, which we already have, 
uh, um, Engineering in, uh, and Construction Industry Training Board, the CITB, which we already have. Mm -hmm. And we are in the final stages of getting uh, OPITO, which is uh, Offshore mm -hmm. uh, Petroleum Training Organization. Mm -hmm. And offshore, uh, this OPITO qualification, once we have it, Uganda will be the first country uh, probably in Africa and the Middle East to have OPITO delivering specifically operational courses. Mm. Uh, there are a few OPITO centers but not doing operational courses and, and these are the courses that the, 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 the industry needs. And so we will not only be uh, training supply the local market but being the regional center will be able to... Now I wanted um, to ask you something uh, Oscar. Yes. I remember two years ago when we had the oil and gas conference and the president was like, you pick, you're offering the diplomas, you mean these diplomas cannot be fit for oil and gas, so now you can. Yes, two we Two years can. ago you, did, you were not ready for that. We were not ready because we got our first uh, uh, certification approval by City and Gills uh, in December 2018. Yes. Uh, we had, though even at that time, our curriculum, because we knew the requirements, yes. so from the onset we had a curriculum that is directly mapped to the OPITO curriculum, the City and Guilds curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, as a matter of fact, all the people that we have tra we had trained previously, we are now certifying. They we do not have, we've given you some money under SDF as well. Definitely. You are aware about it, and uh, you should talk about it, what you're doing, because young people need to know, mm -hmm. if I have already a diploma in welding or pipe fitting, whatever it sure. is, from any other institution, mm. don't you pick? Yes. What happens? How can you be able to assist? Or if I wanted to take a diploma, fresh mm -hmm. or certificate, mm -hmm. do I have to come to you and am I guaranteed that if I come and do a diploma from you right now, mm. I can be able to enter the oil and gas industry? Please yes. talk about yes. it. Uh, thank you, Ruth. I, I was coming to that. I was trying to talk to Ugandans, uh, tell them what foundation that the government has laid to ensure that uh, training takes place and, um, and, and certification takes place. Now, when it comes to how the, the youth now get on board and get enrolled, mm. uh, many people perhaps might think that this being uh, 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 an institution of higher learning, maybe you need to have gone through uh, a, a, an academic career path, mm -hmm. which is not the case. Yes, we have our diplomas, uh, which will require you, uh, just like any national diploma, but we also have five uh, international vocational qualifications mm. that to enroll, we recognize uh, prior learning. Uh, what do I mean by prior learning? You could, for instance, be a welder uh, who does somehow you, you learned welding and you're running about your business and you want to work in the oil and gas industry. You have your experience. You feel that you can weld. But can you be employed? Definitely not. So we can assess such experience, just like we did uh, under your support, uh, SDF and uh, PSFU. So we can uh, retool and improve your skills to the level that is acceptable by the industry. Mm. Yes, so uh, in addition to, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll talk about briefly the, some of the barriers in terms of the youth coming on board, because this day is dedicated to the youth. So oil and gas training is not cheap at all, and that's why government intervened, because uh, it is capital intensive. I've told you every year for the last uh, eight years we've been getting about four, uh, four billion shillings. We are getting close to seven million dollars under ARSDP just to develop infrastructure. So would the private sector handle that? Probably not. So that's how government comes in. Mm. Uh, and now, what about when it comes to training? The consumables that we use for training really make the, because it's hands-on, mm. and you have about three months of on-job orientation, we have to find placements for you. So it becomes costly. For example, uh, an average uh, cost would, a foundation mm. is about one to, to one and a half million. And uh, for a period of about two months. And then the second level is about two million, then the other level is about four million. Mm -hmm. Can an ordinary Ugandan uh, pay for that kind of training? Probably not. And that's how SDF has come on board and sponsored some. Government has gone a step further and uh, put a, a bursary scheme under the Albertine uh, Regional Sustainable Development Program still. 
where for your peak, we will have about up to 690 people studying, fully paid for by the government. And also in other institutions like Sunmaker, for example, will take on another about 200. And uh, so the, the support is not only coming to government institutions. We're just a lead training agency, mm -hmm. but we are also working hand in hand with other private institutions like Sunmaker, uh, Institute of Petroleum Studies, uh, Q-Sourcing. There are quite a number of them. And so the youth are being supported through uh, partnerships like the one we have uh, private sector. Uh, government is still coming on board. And other companies actually sponsoring students. We have a few that are sponsored by private companies, which is a call I would like to really make right now. The mm -hmm. private sector, we are, we are our partners, we are training for you. Mm -hmm. uh, these courses are quite costly. We have skilled, uh, ambitious youth, but uh, who have a barrier of training. So I call upon the private sector to really come on board and support yes. uh, people uh, to train. Oscar, thank you very much. We've heard a lot from you. Now we have Cynthia. Cynthia Mpanga is a renowned communicator and she has been a past president for the Public Relations Association of Uganda. Cynthia, in just a few minutes, because we are almost ending this segment, uh, what, skills do you, what communication skills do you need? Is it really important to have communication skills to be able to benefit from the oil and gas sector? Yeah, thank you, Ruth. I'm um, very delighted to be here. Uh, I want to start off by saying that, I mean, youth could you really do themselves a favor by upskilling. And everybody here on the panel has emphasized the importance of capacity building mm. in terms of you know, any different types of skills that you need, and communication is just one of them. So if you cannot communicate effectively, and we all know, you know there are several advantages that come with communicating effectively. So for instance, if you start your small business somewhere and you are really you know, trying to seek the opportunities that all the, uh, my colleagues have been talking about you know, in terms of penetrating the space, the mineral sector, and being able to offer your services, you've got to be able to put word out. You've got to be able to communicate that effectively, whether it is even writing uh, for support, for wanting association, whether it is writing reports, and this is written communication, but also verbal communication and, of course, content development, which we are seeing a lot of happening with the digital era and technology taking over. And, of course, now with the pandemic happening mm -hmm. and less paper moving around and things like that. So we are, communication is evolving. And the youth need to appreciate the importance of how they communicate and the impact of that communication mm. to their success and to their businesses. For instance, if uh, youth would like to you know, be able to acquire capital, uh, for mm. instance, soft loans uh, or loans from UDB, for instance, mm. they've got to be able to understand what is required and communicate in reports in so many different forms to be able to access those loans and also be able to put out uh, content that builds their brand in such a way that if they are being audited or uh, companies are trying to associate with them, they will find rich content, for instance, on websites. How can, if you're starting, and these days they are, uh, I think in the seg second segment, we'll hear from people from Innovation Village. Uh, there are different apps that can be accessed that are free, that help with almost anything uh, so anybody can design something, can design very good reports, but it's very important for them to be able to penetrate the space uh, where they want to play in and be taken seriously by putting out a particular brand that is, you know, up to scale and up that notch. So we, youth will, if they start their small businesses, they mm. need also to communicate so that they acquire that visibility for their mm. businesses. Mm. Usually uh, established businesses want to associate with a brand, even if it's upcoming and small, but that level of seriousness comes through from how you communicate. And that is why these days people say it's very important that you understand that everybody has a digital personality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by how you communicate, what you communicate consistently, and uh, that's how people perceive you, and that's how they take you. Actually, Cynthia, I was going to ask you, you know, COVID has taught us a lot about going digital, and I wanted to listen to you about your perspective on how the young people can use the digital platforms for marketing and for promoting their businesses. Yeah. 
Okay, so there is an unprecedented opportunity that has been given to us on a silver platter. And unlike in the past where you had to pay millions to place, for instance, mm -hmm. adverts uh, in newspapers, today everybody has a softer landing. Everybody has an opportunity. You cannot say I'm locked out because I do not have money. Mm -hmm. No, that's no longer the issue right now. So there's um, social media, you know, you... Businesses right now, if you are on Instagram, you notice that so many young people are advertising and mm. actually getting a lot of business. And sometimes you don't even have to own the merchandise yourself. Just know where to get it. Be a middle, a middle man of sorts. Get a, you know, a difference by promoting using your own channels. So every single day, there is a lot of skill that is required in effective mm. digital communication as well. You know, it's not about just going and tweeting, hello, I, I have goods, you, if you want to come buy from me. So there's a lot of thought that goes into also that mm. content development yeah. mm. and scheduling it and not overwhelming people and making sure that you're relating and resonating to your audiences and also measuring the impact and is it working? If it's not working, what can I do? But interestingly, and I would like to share, for instance, uh, there are all these tools, these... Mm. Uh, uh, Facebook have brought all these tools that are software that are totally like really free and at some points you have to pay very little money even up to $500 to promote mm -hmm. your content and you know be able to access wider markets and you target very effectively for instance if you're selling uh, you decide that I'm going to uh, in the mineral sector and I'm going to probably I want to get someone I supply goods like maybe foodstuffs or drinks, you know, to a company. And if you are deciding that that is the direction you are taking, you can yeah. today get suppliers online by communicating with them. Today you can communicate with everyone. Almost you can even reach the president because you have seen. And you you say something you quite annoying <laughs> uh, and you get their attention. So the question is how do you communicate effectively? And these days we have jacking that happens, you know, in between big and important conversations and then you have people who jack the conversation by advertising and speaking to their products. So there are many immense opportunities. Cynthia, as we conclude, I wanted to go into the practicality now yes. about communication because we also have young people that are looking for jobs in the sector, all right? And sometimes young people have a challenge of presenting how they present themselves. If you are a pipe fitter, if you're a plumber, if you are whatever it is, and you want, you, you're a truck driver, and you want to enter an office, Total or Sinok and whatever it is, and you want to, 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 to get the job. What can you talk about? Because we have challenges with young people and how they present themselves. What do you have to talk about it as a communicator? Well, the beauty is um, these days, um, and I don't know, communication has become so diverse and dynamic, yes. but also so many opportunities have been opened. Yes. And today, there are all these online courses that are free in t uh, that talk about uh, effective communication or whatever that you can do. Are there some tips are, that you can... I know we have young people that are really watching this program and they're saying, what if I can get one, two or three tips on how I can present myself better? Is there any tip yes, that you can I tell these people? Yes, before I get to the tips, I wanted yeah. to mention that there are several places uh, or... Uh, um, areas where the youth can learn several skills because it's a, not a one-off. Communication is evolving every single day, so we have to evolve with it. And what happens is they can associate with associations like the Public Relations Association of Uganda that yeah. you talked about. It's always organizing all sorts of webinars, all sorts of uh, get-togethers yeah. where they share best practice and so on. But they can also do online courses that are free, and they can also, you know, just um, get mentorship and that grooming. And, but it's so important that young people understand that perception is created by how you express yourself, and that is largely defined by how you present. Mm. I know people, uh, and I was in a meeting room where a business person said they went in with a proposal, they didn't have anything on the ground, and they managed to get a couple of thousand dollars that they had without anything on the ground, nothing established by the way they presented themselves and presented their ideas with confidence and articulately, and they took time to prepare, researched, and came and presented before a board who uh, granted them, you know, several thousand of dollars to implement. And they used that money to invest it 
in the equipment and the things they needed to then execute. And that, and now they are a big player in this company, it's, I mean, in wow. this country. It's very yeah. interesting. So yeah. communication is so important. It really opens doors or it closes doors. We've seen so many instances where you thought someone was like uh, up to squeak, you know, they, they have it together and then yeah. they start speaking and you're like, no. There's no way I'm giving this person or working with this person. In my two minutes left, Cynthia, <laughs> people want those tips. What are those tips you need to go in if you're going inside there and you're saying, I need to get this job, I need to get this contract, and you're presenting yourself? What are those two, three things that you need to do or present? How do you present yourself? Okay, first and foremost, it's about preparation, okay? Uh, preparation in terms of the content you are putting out to the audience and also being able to effectively identify who is the audience, what do they want to hear because you might be the best speaker as long as you don't know what you're going to talk about and the subject matter, you will not be able to effectively articulate what you're trying to sell, whether you're trying to grow your brand. So preparation is very critical in terms of content uh, generation and development and research and also presentation skills. You have got to be able to learn how to present yourself, and that takes a bit of practice because how you present to youth is different from how you present right now on TV mm. or how you present before a boy. So you have got to be able to get maybe people to support you, to mirror you, to practice a little bit before you enter, for instance, to present to a CEO mm. on giving you a business opportunity. Mm. So um, presentation skills, uh, content uh, generation and effectively, and being also articulate in terms of uh, your idea, uh, you know, idea, putting out your ideas. So you have got to be able to also read the mode of the audience. So when you're talking to them and you feel that it's not going in a particular way, which is body language, uh, body language identification, you are able to see that, no, you know, my pitch is not going very well. So how do I change direction halfway and make sure that I don't completely go overboard? Because you can always read the body language of the people you're presenting to and be able to connect with them so that they connect with you in return. Yeah, wow. Well, thank you very much, Cynthia. There's so much that we have picked from you. And I believe that our audience has been able to learn a lot. We had Wilson, we had Alex, we had Oscar. And we had so, and, and myself. By the way, I didn't introduce myself. Unfortunately, your moderator, I'm Ruth Beans, comes okay. And I work with the Private Sector Foundation Uganda, heading the Skills Development Fund. I'm very glad to have these very interesting, smart gentlemen. You know, in the oil and gas sector, you don't have to put on a tie. You don't have to put on a tie. You don't have to put on these shoes. It's 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 a sector that. It's about practical and working. We are going to get back and we are going to discuss about the practicalities in the sector. And I hope that Wilson, Alice, Oscar, and everybody, we should be able to tell more the young people what is available and what we have to do. We are coming back. It was Stone Roofing Uganda Limited. A company, you know, Uganda, we were training Gera kwata ndi kibwa engineer anko yo yo eli sachiwana nga yimusomesa ya tusomesa twali team ya abantu banje nange mwe nali era na tusomesa ngiri je basobola okubanga amainja ga bantu twagata ko value okusobola okubanga ngo je ko gasiba wansi muzija obogasiba ku misinje Oboga kwa yesa interior decoration, gaso vilo genda kuruf, nga kasodi. Chasi nga kumpa lidi za kwa mbwena mwami nkoyo yowe ya liya chinyo nyola. Ilabu tuwa kwa la mwendo hausi ya soka chava yo vulonji. Chari chila vika vulonji, nga 
kiso wolo okubanga chibitinga challenges ezali in construction ezimu na dere squataga na akasoria nja kwe chokola bilako obusoria obusinga bobo tunde roof zabo tezilastinga banga pam kutunulia na akasoria kama inja ah ngovude kuchovu wanga zogya tunoya security wise akasoria kama inja si changu mu byoke ya mbiso kubanga ita mu kugwa mu nyumba ekitali ku mabati oba ku mategura nti amabati omuntu ajani makansi na gasala ata amategura sobolo pangula ko limu kulimu ekitali kasoli akafa kama yinja bo tunulira embera yobudde eri munda mu nyumba like room temperature jo bo inango limu nyumba munda bati wetaga air conditioners oba oba heaters okubante nyumba yo ekuwe bugumo be kuwempe ombudo obutufu kati bwe twatunulira ebintu ebyenja olo twalabanga senga ba client ba fe ba vayo ne ba adopting ekintu kino era kijja kuba kyongera ko ne ku bavubuka betusobola okuwa emirimu bavubuka banafe kubanga by then twali team ntono ne ngola abantu tulaba je tulaga akusinga chetagisa magezi baski ah bwe njogera ku magezi chetagisa okubanga otendekebwa ngofunya obukugu obumalo kusobola okubanga klanti akuwadde omulimbo obo munnyonyo decho chogeno mukolera ngabwa kuwa senteze omukolere product yegenda vayo bulonje che kisengo kuwe chikolo then chetagane klanti ono kubanga ali support ba part from kuwa senteze bazeta akisokolo omulimbo abula nga ali support mu mbera anti chitwala mu obudde chitwala ngejali art ndi ya designing klanti ona ino kubanga asobola kubanga wa good communication in between the client and the service providers kati capital get single kubanga tweta agaye wa machinery okusobola kubanga tujamba ko kubanga tusobola kubanga to beating at demand in terms of supply nti amayinja gano je gava mu bilombe gatwale banga dino kubanga gabera ngasimibwa kusobola kutuka eno katale kituka koze seza kitegeza bwe tuba tufunye machines esobola kutuyamba ke eri mu mininga yamba ko kubanga tubane ne nama raw materials ngazitumala bulunji nga client talinda banga deno kusobola kubanga afuna omulimu tuigiriza banaf banji okusobola kubanga nawo ba obtaining a skill rent ah tukoze mwe somero eri manyidwa ministry of education okubanti tutende kabana fe formally kusobola kubanti basobola kubanga batikira every after 2 years ye ya ringa achievement ye sinzo kubenene cha tukoze projects ezili over 20 edanga zili wano mu Uganda edanga zongera okujjayo patriotism nti gobo ko eseze ebintu bya Uganda sobola kufuna beauty fanagana ko bwete twina abakozi betu wadde emirim bali mu 200 ne twina aba bali specialized bali over 50 kubanga okugaba emirim ku kutwaira mu ebintu binje nengeri je construction company ye koze saro materials zone ziva mayinja abavubuka bano basobola kubanga bali partition na yaba kugu abali specifically for stone roofing bali over 50 ne ne wakwade twina mu abala nti twina mu abazimbi ba block twina mu abakomedes justinga yakuba miti ye specialization jain atenga tushayaniriza abalo kujyo twega tako magezi ganyizo ku abavubuka bazoke bano nyo muni mu kusobola kubongera yo maso bale mo kutulo okulinda ebintu ebyenja olo bibe kwasa naye no nyo mulimu ogusobola kubanga kuwa value gongera kwe gwanga lyo value okole atogu kole passionate linga owulira ochagala oja kusobola kubanga oko benefiting ensi ne family Uh, good, um, good afternoon once again. Uh, welcome back to this uh, live show where we are discussing the opportunities for the youth in the um, oil and gas sector. And it's part of uh, 
a 90-day oil and gas uh, convention that's been happening and started running on the 26th of April, and it will go on until the 26th of November. So we've covered so many different aspects uh, of how different segments, uh, sectors in the economy can benefit from the oil and gas sector, from the mineral sector. And today, we are tackling particularly the youth. So um, right before you, you have a panel. Some of them have just joined us. And uh, right beside me is a lady, I think the only person who's joined us, Samali. Samali, you're most welcome. Samantha, Samantha welcome to the show. Thank you so for Samantha is from the Innovation Village. Uh, she's just joined us. And uh, my co-moderator, Ruth, did a fantastic job in the first segment. Thank you very much, Ruth. Yes. So Ruth, you missed out in the first segment. So I am going to start with you. And uh, <coughs> if I may repeat, that is uh, Ruth uh, Bienzika Musoke from the Private Sector Foundation of Uganda. And uh, she's doing a great job in there. So Ruth, tell us uh, quickly, what gaps have you realized um, you do skills development and all this. What gaps have you realized and what are you doing to make sure that you are preparing the, the youth to be able to actively participate in the mm. mineral sector? Thank you very much, Cynthia. Now, one of the things that we've realized about young people is that when you say oil and gas or oil and mining, it is like a myth, you know? If you say we have so many opportunities, so many jobs, so many contracts, they don't have an idea of where do I enter. They don't see that entry point. And I think when you hear from what Petroleum Authority did on the presented concerning the logistic platform, it's very important for young people to also know that that platform, there is an opening for young people. Sometimes they think it's for these large, large companies. And because of that, the excitement a little bit reduces. You know, there was a lot of excitement so many years back when we said we have oil and gas. And then currently, people are like, maybe when I'm too small, I might not have I may not have an opportunity. And I want to applaud the Chamber of Mines for organizing this opportunity, 90 days of oil and mining, because it provides an opportunity for young people to know. But I also want to request the Petroleum Authority, the Ministry, to ensure that across the country, at whatever level, even when I'm a young person in agriculture, I should be able to know where is my entry point? What is it there for me? That is an area that we need to work together to ensure that people are able to understand. The other challenge we see is that the youth themselves don't know exactly what skills. Not until I started doing SDF that I started really understanding and saying, oh, they need to get people who are able to work in small space. They, also, they need a particular truck driver. They need a particular welder. People would not understand why, why, why. And I think one of the things that we need to make young people understand is to let them know this particular skills. We have been funding a lot of uh, certification programs. But also when I give sometimes money to, come to institutions, they actually struggle to get people to come and even train for free. You know, it is free of charge. You put an advert and we say, Chamber, we give you some resources, for example. We have given Chigumba. We are working with uh, Tap TV. We are working with Safeway Rightway. So many, you know. And sometimes they have a challenge getting the young people to come in for even the free training to get certified. Why? They don't believe. First of all, these young people don't know this training. is. We are giving it to them at a subsidized rate. If they knew that they have to pay almost $1,000, but they are getting it for free, maybe they would, they would not delay if you put an advert. The other challenge is that sometimes they are like, OK, I am getting the training. I'm going to be certified, and I'll have my city and guilds. But am I going to get employed there and then? That is one of those things. And of course, we also have those that um, were not highly educated, but they had their skills originally. And I think my colleague from UPIC talked about recognition of prior learning, where you have so many people, they had their skills before. They knew what they were doing. They are not highly, because you know, in a skill, a skill is not the language. And I want to tell young people that if you know what you're doing, when they are do, examining you, even, even if it is ECTIB or OPITO, they will look at its practical. They give you the assignment and they're able to assess you. That is why a Chinese doesn't speak English, but you're able to show what you're able to do. So speaking about that, so what viable skills do the youth need and oh, what are those skills that are so critical that the youth need to be gainfully employed or enterprising in the oil and mining sector? 
There are two areas. One is the technical skills that are required by the oil and gas sector. Not any training is required by the sector. That training, even if you have it, it must meet the international standards of the sector. And I think as UPIC or uh, Potrem Authority said, there are particular certification that the sector needs, like city and guilds, it can be OPITO, it can be ECTIB, it can be any other. So it does not mean that if you're a welder from Katwe, or if you're a welder with a diploma in Chambogo, you can work in the sector, no. You must be able to identify those institutions. We have been able to support particular institutions to have international certification for oil and gas. If you go to UPIC, you get it. If you go to uh, Nawanyago, you get it. If you go to uh, Yiganga, you get it. If you go to, to Nakawa, you get it. If Chamber of Petroleum and Mining is also currently now working with, uh, with, uh, with uh, August to be able to see well, August see well, to be able to offer this training. So if you're able to go in the particular institutions, then the second one is what we call emotional, emotional skills. And sometimes I have to say behavior skills. These are skills whereby even if you say, I am a plumber, the best welder you can see, but I cannot relate with others when I'm working, you will not get the job. Even if you say, for me, I am the best truck driver, but you don't keep time. Emotional intelligence. Nobody, huh? nobody is going to take you up. There are people who mm -hmm. do not take responsibility. Even if you say, for me, if you give me this road or if you give me this, I would be the best. But if you don't keep your responsibility, I will tell you, this is what you have to do today. And we agree from here to there. You don't do it. Many Ugandans do not take responsibility. And that is a very, very, very big problem. A number of Ugandans have attitude pro problems. The moment you start saying, Wilson, today we have this assignment. Oh, oh no, 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 that one today. Mm, Madam, it is, it is too late for me to start that already you are turned off. And that, I can tell you, put employers off. It is these small things. I always tell people that the best, the best workers, are not the PhDs, they are not the first class, but they are people who are able to manage the emotional intelligence so of their me, employers. How are you supporting the youth in terms of developing the right skilling, in terms of behavior, emotional that you mentioned. How are you supporting them uh, under skills development? Fund? We provide grants to various training institutions to ensure that as they do their activities, we give you a grant. Who would give a grant? For example, Nakawa Chigumba was here. We give you a grant and then we tell you, okay, how many are you going to train? They'll give you both technical and social skills. We are supporting internship, apprenticeship for, for students because we did realize that a number of people live out of school and enter straight into employment. You're talking about something you have never seen. You're entering an environment that you don't have an idea about. And we have so far supported over 5,000 students to have internship and apprenticeship in companies, various companies. And for me, this has really worked. And what we have seen is that out of these 10%, 10 to 15% have been taken up where they have had internship. And what is surprising is that when you ask a, an employer, why did you choose Two, these three out of a hundred, they will tell you social skills. You know, they are reliable. They are able to fit into the environment. So this one, we're actually able to do it under SDF as well. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, very, very interesting and very insightful. There you have it. I mean, uh, she talked about the technical and social skills that you're getting and free grants and subsidized, you know, access to all this killing. So really, the youth need to uh, pick this up and go to institutions like UPIC, Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, Yiganga, Nakao, and so on. So thank you very much, Ruth, for uh, educating us. So I want to bring in Alex at this point from Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Alex, of course there are some barriers to youth you know, entering the extractive sector. What is government and what is uh, POW doing about that? Thank you, Cynthia. Um, before I get to, to that question, allow me to still uh, drill into the opportunities because it's, it's very important for, yes. the, for, for the youth to, to really Go appreciate right ahead. Um, <clears throat> these opportunities. We talked about the jobs that uh, will be created uh, mm -hmm out of these activities. And um, we know that the oil and gas is not a mass employer, but there are those ripple effects that will come as a result of the, of the developments. The direct jobs are about 13,000, okay? but you'll have a lot more jobs uh, that will be induced and direct 
as a result of the activities, as a result of people moving into the oil producing areas in the Alberta and Grabbing, a lot of services will come up, a lot of needs will come up. People will set up um, restaurants, people will set up hotels, tourism is going to boom. So that kind of activity, that ripple effect will bring about an extra 150,000 jobs. Now for a youth who's out there, like what uh, um, Ruth has been talking about, getting those skills I think will be a very good positioning. And um, if, if you look at the construction activities, again, the number of people who will be there who will need to eat, because you will have about uh, close to 100,000 uh, people that will be housed in different camps, both along the ECOP uh, pipeline route and uh, in the oil fields. Then you also have about a million people who will move into the region for different opportunities. Now, all those people will need to be able to eat. Now, for a youth who's out there, who's doing his agriculture, who was, uh, who's probably farming uh, a bit of fruits or vegetables, all these are opportunities that we keep on um, talking about. And, and, and a lot of effort has gone into, you know, uh, teaching them, getting them together. We have a program called the, the, the Agriculture Development Program, which also Stabic has actually come on board. Have different uh, farmers, especially the youth, put them in groups, train them, and then link them to, uh, to, to the market, really. So for, for someone out there, a youth, uh, there are lots of opportunities that we need to prepare. But like we mentioned, you need to be ready. You need to get those certifications that we've talked about. Uh, UPIC has mentioned that uh, they are able to offer those certifications. And government, yes, has been able to do a number of interventions, like you were asking. How are we trying to break that ice, for, you know, help the youth to be able to access opportunities. Number one, information dissemination, like this particular show. We have been, I think at, at the authority, we have tried as much as we can to push this information out there. We have had different engagements, um, both generic uh, and focused. We have had um, focused engagements for sector, uh, sector engagements, agriculture, construction, just to discuss in detail what is in for us in there. How do we get on board? What are the requirements? We've also gone ahead to have a conversation with the youth. We've gone to the Chambogo University to have an interaction with the youth. We've gone to UCU, Mukono, Makere University, because there are groups of youth who are interested in oil and gas. Okay? So that bit of information sharing is very, very important for them to know where we are and what is required. We've also been able to work with these institutions to offer them exposure visits to the graben, to the oil fields, for them to be able to appreciate what is on the ground. If we're talking about an oil well, how does it look like, for instance? If, if, if I'm pursuing a course uh, that leads me to, to probably work in the oil and gas sector, what is that infrastructure that we're talking about? So this particular exposure has also given them an opportunity to understand you know, the whole, because it's new in, in the country, so for them to go out to the field and look at all these items, it's very, very good for them to appreciate where we are. And again, we've also gone ahead to, you know, uh, have them placed in, in, in different organizations for internship opportunities because we need to build their skills. The sector is highly practical. So the oil companies closely working with the PAU, we've been I mean, they've been able to offer those internship uh, opportunities to be able to help them uh, upskill. Again, working with um, different stakeholders, uh, like the private sector foundation, they worked with GIZ. We have trained over 1,500 uh, youth in different skill sets that relate to the oil and gas um, sector. So that when that time comes, when, that, when they register on the NOG tier and when opportunities arrive or arise, then they're able to be picked and they have the right um, skill, skill sets. So really, that, those are some of the things we have been able to do. And they're quite interesting. And, 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 um, my colleague from UPIC mentioned something about the ASDP, the Abbott and Graben Sustainable Development Program, where over 600 youth have been given scholarships to upskill them to be able to also benefit from. So tell me, uh, you said, of course, you, you, you do a lot of information sharing and so mm -hmm. on, but you know, communication is communication. You have to communicate so many times to reach all the different you know, people wherever they are. How, how easy is it for young people 
to just approach PAL for the support, you know, for, for the support you are talking about, for the information. How accessible is it? I know you have websites and so on, but how easy is it for them to access the information and access you and know about the opportunities? Thank you. I think PAU, um, I think it's one of those entities where it's very easy for you to approach and, and get information other than what is on the website. We've been able to host uh, a lot of, you know, students who are doing the research and they need, you know, different kind of information. So as long as you, you write to the PAU, uh, it could be an email. You just need to send an email to the PAU, state what you need. We'll be able to respond and uh, have an appointment you with you either physically, explain uh, to you what you really need, or if you want a documented or a, a write-up about something, or if you want access to certain, you know, information or certain areas, we will be able to, to, to do that. So let me ask you, for instance, if a university like Neja University decides yeah. that, you know, they want to know more and they want, you know, uh, engagement directly with PAU and they organize themselves into a group, and, and they try to approach you, would you be able to give them audience? Uh, do you do such exceptions? Very much so. We have done them several times. Uh, they usually write letters officially. Um, and then, of course, when you write a letter, we, we respond. We give you an appointment. So they have we have to write never letters. turned down. They have to write to you an email. And this email is on your website, I presume? It's, it's ed at PAU. That goes to our executive director. And we will be able to, you know, give you audience. You have to write to the executive director to get audience. That's it. That's the general contact email yes. for yes. the PAU. So it's ed at? Ed at pau.go.ug. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So tell so us. All those so all, all those opportunities are really open. And uh, if you need to access the field, for instance, uh, you also, you know, right. write to us. We have um, the training institutions. We have an association that, uh, that is called Oil and Gas Trainers Association. Uh, that, you know, encompasses training institutions for oil and gas. And those ones, through that as well for members, at the moment you can just use that platform. They are able, we have quarterly skills dialogue where we meet with these training institutions, discuss uh, the challenges, discuss aspects to do with the curriculum, discuss the trends where we are headed, and those aspects of we want to visit this place, we want this information, usually come up. And then we have a conversation, and we give um, freely information, really. Thank and of course, coming sharing. to our office, that is also you know, an, an option. An we are at Amber House, uh, fourth floor, or oh, in Tebe. Okay. Um, yeah. So quickly, take us through the barriers and how you are supporting you know, the youth to... How is government and PAU uh, PAL supporting the youth you know, to overcome the barriers? We know there are barriers to, for them penetrating the sector. Yes. Um, I think I highlighted on, on, on those um, barriers and how the PAU together with uh, government uh, uh, are trying to address the aspects of scholarships that we've talked about, the information sharing and dissemination that we have consistently um, really made and, and, and the different engagements, the conferences. We have the National Content Conference, uh, the one that you know, invites everyone. Then we have um, this supply development workshops. The regulations require that oil companies uh, hold supply development workshops every quarter. You invite suppliers. Um, we've also had organizations or companies that go to the universities and they have those specific engagements with the youth and address their, their, their concerns, their information um, uh, requirements. And again, we've also had uh, the National Oil and Gas Talent Register, which gives the youth visibility on the opportunities. Because talent register? How does someone register with that? The National Oil and Gas Talent Register is also an online um, uh, register that is available on our website, www.pau.go.ug. It is similar to the National Supplier Database that registers entities or companies that are interested in supplying the sector. But this one is only for people who are interested in getting jobs. You create your profile, like you'd have a LinkedIn uh, profile, upload your documents, and then the oil companies are able to access this system, they're able to recruit off this system, and the other oil servicing companies, because the oil and gas sector, the services that are required, or even the companies that apply in the sector, cut across different sectors. So you might not be employed in the oil and gas sector per se, but a company that probably provides services in a different sector, typical civil construction company, typical logistics company, is on that system, the National Oil and Gas Register. So if you want to, you can be employed. So that is also another avenue that the PAU has put in place 
to enable the youth to get exposure and be able to have that visibility. And it's like I mentioned, the youth of these days are tech survey. That's why we made it online. In the comfort of your living room, you can create your profile, upload your documents, and then you have visibility to so many companies that we have on the NSD. Thank you. So I'll come back to you, Alex. Um, I just want to bring in um, Samantha from the Innovation Village into the conversation at this point because she just joined us and hasn't said a word. So Samantha, Innovation Village, we've heard a lot about it. It's everywhere. You're very visible, by the way. Well done. But I wanted to find out, what do you see young people doing to position themselves to take advantage of these emerging and upcoming lucrative sectors? What do you see them doing in terms of, you know, innovation, you know, positioning? What are they doing? Thank you for having me on the show. Um, so okay. the Innovation Village is an ecosystem builder. And this is simply bringing together entrepreneurs, uh, corporates, developmental agencies, government, and academia to solve for challenges in the community, leveraging uh, entrepreneurship, innovation, and technology. And... You know, what we do specifically is, is especially at Future Lab, um, um, you know, is create value from innovation. So when we say value from innovation, it's who are the best startups in the industry solving for existing challenges. And these are challenges that uh, corporates face. These are challenges that government faces across different sectors. So when we talk about um, oil and gas, um, and, and, and this, is a, you know, this is more of a collaborative initiative where it's not just about the entrepreneurs or the startups. It's really about also uh, corporates, government agencies, and any sector player in the specific um, you know, challenge and sector. So, you know, so we, run, we run programs throughout the year. And during these programs, we do get to identify, again, best startups across the industries provide mentorship and technical support to grow them, um, but then also strengthening collaborative initiatives with sector players. Uh, because, you know, the challenges that, that are in each sector, so for example, if, if, I, if I talk oil and gas, it could be in, you know, management and software platforms, it could be in, you know, um, energy efficiency, uh, um, you know, the environment, um, emissions, and we do find that the youth specifically have innovative business models around these challenges, but of course um, what we see you know, lacking and of course trying to strengthen is in collaboration with external players mm -hmm. and it really creates, it, you know, it creates a seamless, uh, not necessarily seamless, but it creates a platform where, you know, there are solutions being developed. You have all these different players tapping into these solutions, and you can easily find that a problem that, can, that you can spend two years solving can easily be solved within 13 weeks. And this has been, you know, this, this, this has been shown globally, but also locally. And so it's, if we have, you know, oil and gas coming into the industry now, then how can we then tap into um, what the youth and what startups are doing? And I wanted to find out, Innovation Village, how does a typical youth access the services that you offer? I mean, I'm not talking about your um, everyday, you know, person who studied in Namagonga, they're exposed and so on. So the youth uh, from Masaka, you know, outside, you know, Kampala, how do they access your services and solutions? So we have, uh, you know, when we, when we say different platforms, uh, this is through you know, community initiatives where we get to um, have engagements with different businesses and one, address the challenges that they're facing in these businesses and provide uh, mentorship support. Uh, then we also have, you know, then we also have the programs that then we, we, we have throughout the year. And these are more, you know, these are more, you know, three to six month programs where we get to also partner with with different stakeholders, and then solve for challenges. Um, and then we also have, you know, platforms like the 97 Fund, which actually uh, puts investment 
in businesses. And these are through, you know, a certain process. So I have a great business, if it's in energy, if it's in agriculture, um, and, you know, you can get funding to scale that solution through the 97 fund. And also that, uh, you know, also driving local investment in these solutions. Um, and, and again, these, these different platforms are to bring together entrepreneurs, but also bring together key stakeholders, uh, you know, government, corp you know, corporates, uh, academia, to then get to, you know, um, to drive entrepreneurship and innovation. Yeah, but I, w I want to hear more about the youth. You talked about, you know, all these high level. I'm thinking if I don't have a lot of confidence, I studied, you know, in the outskirts, but I still want to be part and play into this sector. And I know that I've heard of Innovation Village, and I would really like to, you know, access that. I mean, besides the corporates and, you know, enterprises and so on, how can the youth easily access, or what can they do? Yes, so um, specifically through our community programs is where we get to, we get to identify all these different, um, you know, entrepreneurs that are coming in and saying, you know, hi, I have an idea, or um, this is where I'm struggling in my business. And we, we then get to customize different uh, programs for them. So we do have, again, that platform that is dedicated to just the youth, dedicated to what challenges are they facing. Um, and then work with them to say, you know, what skills gap are lacking, but then still get to, you know, take them throughout, you know, we, 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 what we do is not just focus on one thing and say, you know, we have skilled you, you can now go out. No, it's saying, you know, this is where you can get skilled, then how about then, co you know, collaborating with key state stakeholders, then how about getting funding, so really completing that loop. Okay. All right. Uh, that's uh, Samantha uh, from uh, uh, Future Lab Lead, yeah, from Innovation Village. Uh, thank you so much, Samantha, for sharing what uh, you're all about and what youth can access. So I want to bring in Wilson at this point in time. And uh, I'll remind you, Wilson is from uh, UNDP and Alia spoke in the first session. You've been very quiet, uh, but I'm bringing you in because we've heard a lot about the Youth for Business Facility. Okay, so what measures uh, have you put in place to make sure that there is equitable access, you know, to these opportunities that you've been talking about? Thank you very much, Cynthia. Uh, what we have done to ensure there is equitable access, first of all, we have rolled out a call for proposals. In rolling out this call for proposals, we have used various platforms to actually ensure that the youth are able to access this information and apply. For instance, uh, we have organized webinars uh, for the youth uh, where we, have, we explain about, about the proposal, we receive inquiries, we pro respond to questions on how they can apply. That's one of the methods we have been using. Uh, also, and by the way, the, the next webinar, which will be, uh, is going to be on the 18th of November. So I'd like to encourage the youth out there. Please access uh, the information, get the webinar, and, and have some more engagement so you can be able to have an understanding of how to apply and how to access these funds. So that is one of the ways we are, we, we are, we are accessing, uh, we are accessing uh, the information. The other one, in addition to that, we are providing this information on the websites, the call for proposals on the UNDP website, Stanbic website, and also on social media platforms for both UNDP and Stanbic. We are also ensuring that um, we provide information on the various branches, all Stanbic, up country and everywhere. That those who are, are able to access it can go there and get that information. We are also uh, organizing road shows in partnership with Stanbic, where we go out there and we are sensitizing uh, the district commercial officers and the community development officers in diverse districts, so they can be able to explain or provide information 
concerning these proposals. Those are some of the ways we are actually trying to ensure that this information is able to uh, reach as many people as possible. And of course, the call for, pro for proposal is still ongoing. Okay, thank yes, you. So yes. the sustainability part of it, you yes. know, we've heard about sustainability plans and so on yes. and so forth. Yes. I think the question I have is how can we focus on uh, bringing the sustainable development goals into our businesses? How can the youth adopt the SDGs in their businesses? Yes, one of the, <laughs> one of the ways is relates to the targeting of the sectors. We are targeting the, the sectors where we can have impact-driven innovations in, in those specific sectors, which are like to have a big impact on sustainable development goals. And the sectors we're talking about, we have agriculture, we have got development minerals, we have got manufacturing, we have got ICT for development, we have got creative arts, <coughs> and um, those, are some, those are the sectors that we are targeting and manufacturing as well. So we believe that in those sectors, uh, by having solutions, uh, that the innovative solutions, that uh, the youth will be uh, rolling out, we should be able to have a big impact on the sustainable development goals. Okay, thank you. Yes. Joel, I want you to come in here uh, very quickly. And I want you to talk about the process and uh, the practicality of youth you know, accessing the support of uh, business incubator, you know. What is the process? What is the practicality? What do they do? Um, thank you again, Cynthia. Um, maybe I would like to pick up from uh, where my colleague uh, Wilson um, has, has just ended. Uh, because, you know, we have this partnership with the UNDP, and we have been moving across the country, disseminating this information to the district places, uh, with the DCOs and the committed development officers discussing with these community development officers who are the experts in the particular districts. I personally visited the north. So if you go to the Stambik branch uh, in Gulu, or you go to the district offices or the city uh, authorities in Gulu, or Kitgum, or Lira, all these places we have been at physically to ensure that everything is explained and that the officers um, uh, who are on ground can disseminate the information uh, very ably to the young people. So we have made it very accessible to the young people who are there. Um, secondly, as, uh, as Tambic Bank, we have uh, over 69 branches across the country. Now, if you go to walk in, in any of the branches, over the 69 branches across the country, you will receive the information about the business incubator and about any other partnerships that we have from uh, uh, UNDP and also with uh, um, any other entities like other UN agencies. This morning, we were launching the Economic Enterprise Research Fund. Uh, with the UN agencies. And this will spread across the country, um, benefiting circles, VSLs, cooperatives, which are largely made up of various persons, from young people to the rest. So all these can access that information. So we have made the process easy. But also to emphasize, um, in the past we were concentrating in Kampala. And our, 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 our limits were at least one year in business, 30 million turnover, but then we realized that there are very many young people who are missing out at this. So we scaled down. Now, we are no longer just training in Kampala. In fact, we left Kampala for online. Those who are on digi uh, or in the digital platforms. Mm -hmm. And now we are training at the district uh, uh, centers. So we are working with various district authorities across the country. And we are running regional trainings um, uh, at the district level. So if a young person cannot come to Kampala, just go to the district authorities or to the nearest Stambic branch near you, you will be guided on how to apply to the Stambic Business Incubator, and you will attain training from the districts uh, that so far we have selected. Currently, we, are in, uh, we will be training uh, before the end of this year in over 12 districts um, uh, across the country. So we have scaled down as low as possible to make sure that the entire program is accessible to every potential and interested Ugandan out there. So the former and informal sector, you said you are on district level. Does that mean that you are covering all the districts in Uganda currently or not? Or are you access, uh, providing that where you have presence? You see, Cynthia, I should be very careful when you talk about the districts in Uganda because tomorrow there may be a bigger number. So uh, at this stage, no, uh, not all. Uh, we are focusing, at least I can speak to all the cities we are covered 
And in every, we have a, a coordination center in Mbarara for the west, a coordination center in the east, uh, Mbale, and then for the north, uh, Guru. Uh, so all the surrounding districts, at least four, uh, four to five districts per region, uh, are being covered even this year already uh, there. Uh, but also when you took, talk about the informal and formal sector, as I said, whereas in Kampala we were uh, focused on the registered businesses, in the regions we are guided by the district commercial officers that are there who identify these uh, community-based organizations that are registered. And we support them to tell them uh, that there has to be a second level. There has to be the next step of uh, attaining or participating in the oil and gas industry or even scaling. You just must become formal. You must learn these processes. How do I pay taxes? How do I register my business? And we guide you according to that. So that from informality to formality, then we push you to power. And uh, the opportunities, uh, then you can now supply and compete favorably with the businesses that are, that are competing and know how to manage bids and how to contract. And for the smaller businesses, we're encouraging them to do, to do uh, joint ventures uh, so that it is not about competing. Uh, we can uh, harness our resources, come together, and then deliver, uh, deliver the services that we need. Now, just uh, in conclusion, with the support we have with the UNDP, we give you the capacity, you qualify for the financing or apply for the financing. So capacity built, access, uh, you have the access to fi financing, what more will you be asking for? That's Thank you, quite sir. interesting. Uh, but uh, I mean, like uh, the youth, I'm hoping there are many youth listening in because the content is very, very useful and very robust. But uh, Ruth, let me ask you, from Private Sector Foundation and the rest of your partners, what more are you doing? Uh, you talked about, of course, the skilling and the types of tr skills that youth need and the capacity. But what more um, is PSFU and your partners doing to make sure that we adequately prepare the youth to take part in the oil and mining sector? In the beginning, I talked about the challenges that young people are facing to access the sector. And from the panel, you can see that actually some of these things that they are trying, we are trying to address them. One of the other issues is access to finance. And I remember when UNDP Wilson was talking about some of the things that they are doing, uh, you can see that they are providing some possibilities. And I think this is an area where we need more partners on board because the young people are millions of Ugandans. What UNDP is doing with Stanbic Bank is just a drop in the ocean. We need to make sure that we have a bank that is accessible or, or bank products that are accessible for young people. When you talk about UDB, UDB is too big for a young person. I also sit on the board of the Microfinance Support Center, and I know that we give credits to groups at 13%, 8% to circles, but still the money is not enough. You get it? We need to make sure that if I leave school and I want to go into the sector of oil and gas, I am able to have quick working capital at affordable, affordable interest rate. Or I can be able to find business angels. You know, they are business angels. You know, business angels, these are people who have an art. They have this, what you're doing at heart, and they're saying, I'm willing to put a seed into this business. I see a future. And once it grows, I'll grow it with you. So that area of access to finance is a journey that PSFU is taking forward. We have been advocating and we are calling upon all any partners that we have in this country. We already have UNDP, we have others and the EU and many others, of course, that are working together, but much more, even the government. We need to revive our corporate bank. We need to have an SME bank, for example. We need to have particular products for this food because I can tell you, I have skilled 50,000, more than 50,000. That is a huge number from 99 district. But after skilling a young person, you will say, okay, you have taught me this, but give me the machine to start making the shoes. You get it? Meaning we should be able to support some of these things up to the end. We also need to allocate particular businesses for young people. How does it help if you go to compete for a contract in the oil and gas sector and you're competing with a large, even cleaning the, the, the shore areas? You, you find a large company wants it. If we are able to say, PPD is able to say, you know what, this particular small assignments, if an assignment is worth 20 million, 50 million, 30, this is for a young business. 
and it is dedicated to ensure that even if, even if it's at the district level, you have a young person who is able to compete. Because some of the challenges I normally find is that a young person comes in and says, now, I have tried, I've not stolen, but I'm telling, I'm asking, can I fumigate? But even fumigation business, you're competing with very huge companies. They have nothing, they have no option. And for me, that is extremely, extremely important. The issue of skilling, ensuring that we have a fund. Uganda must have a skills development fund. What I'm trying to do at PSFU, SDF is a government program funded by, with, with credit from the World Bank. We need a fund that is Ugandan-owned, Uganda, Ugandans put in the money, and it is there for Ugandans forever, that every single Ugandan have a chance to say, if I started to be a teacher, if I did social sciences, but there are no jobs, I can divert my skill. And I have, um, I have money, free money. I can only speak from a fund to be able to upgrade this. Look at COVID. With COVID, many people lost their jobs. Teachers have not been working. For, it's coming to a year, all right? And there's nothing more that they are able to do. Just imagine if this, during this period of time, a teacher was saying, okay, if I can't teach, at least let me learn how to do masks, all right? And there is a fund that can be able to assist. There should be funds to assist, to train Ugandans, to be able to be the first choice of employers in any industry. And the oil and gas industry should be the priority. So really, those, for me, those are really, really critical areas that need to be worked on. Great. Thank you for sharing. Uh, so, Alex. I just want to ask you, how are we pulling in the former and informal sector um, in the supply chain, you know, as uh, POW? What are you doing? Thank you, Cynthia. Um, like I earlier mentioned in my uh, discussion, true, you will have a segment of the, you know, value chain that is, that, that is informal. And in all honesty, the oil and gas, especially the, the, the IOCs, we want a formalized uh, business, okay? So what we're trying to do is to help um, informal businesses get formalized. If you look at our tool, the National Supplier Database, okay, the, the registration requirements it requires are uh, requirements that essentially lead to an entity to be formalized. Mm. And what we are doing is that the campaigns that we have done uh, across the country, we have engaged entities like the URA, uh, to help in registration, entities like RSB to formalize. Uh, we also work with the NSS because that is also an aspect that we usually require. So all these engagements, we try as much as possible to help these businesses um, get formalized. Because as an informal player, your opportunities, in all honesty, are very limited. If you want to break through, you have to formalize the business. And that's the, the gospel we keep on preaching. And as, and, and as government, maybe the icing on the cake is that um, there's uh, an industrial enhancement center that is in the offing, uh, which is going to supplement what Stanbic is doing, what the incubator uh, village is doing. So I think the youth will be spoiled for choice on actually where, where, where to go. And that center is meant to tackle those issues. You have your idea, <clears throat> you have your, your, your concept, but you, you don't know how to put it together. You don't have partners you, because you could have a joint venture partner uh, that will come through that, that, that IEC. You want to be able to, you know, um, take them through the formalization process where you need to register. How do I access these different offices? Because there are lots of people, especially the youth, they don't know where to begin from. If I want to formalize my business, where do I start from? Probably someone is deep in Bulisa, okay? And, and they don't know aspects of formalization. So the IEC that government is um, planning to set up is going to go a long way in helping the youth um, put together their businesses. And that's what we all want, formalization of businesses, because that's the only way they'll thrive. That's true. Mm. That's absolutely correct. So, I mean, we've heard a lot about the NDP3 and all that. And what are you doing, or power of government, what are they doing to make sure that the youth are familiar with this plan especially in the context of, you know, the oil and mining sector? The NDP three years, um, the, the National, National Planning Authority is essentially charged with, you know, the dissemination of this kind of information. Mm. But as, as the authority, we, we know that the oil and gas sector is one of those key pillars that, are, that have been, you know, highlighted in the NDP three to drive and, and the, the economy 
and create um, that value that we, we, we really want. And we know that the oil and gas sector pretty much touches on every other sector of the economy. If you talk about agriculture, we talked about the people that we need to eat, the influx of people that would probably be in that particular area, it touches on agriculture. If you talk about um, a construction and transport, we will need about 25,000 drivers, what you're helping to, to, to skill. Um, that, that, you know, with, with logistics, if you talk about housing, the number of people we are talking about, the 1, the 1 million people, the 500,000 people, they will need accommodation in wherever places they will be. So what the authority has done, we have tried to harness those linkages. Uh, we have had engagements with the different sector players, agriculture, um, construction, transport, housing, health. Several multi-sectoral uh, committees have been set up for health, for all those different sectors, to critically sit down, look at the gaps that are, that are, that, that are there, look at ways on how to address those gaps, look at the way we can harness those synergies, those linkages, those opportunities. And as I speak, um, there's also a study that uh, the authority is about to commence, particularly in agriculture. We've also had uh, specific uh, conferences, just to highlight these opportunities, because you see, if you have this conference that brings about everyone, you lose what you want to communicate. Mm -hmm. So we've had targeted engagements with the health sector, They've been able to go to the Albert and Graben, for instance. Uh, they've done uh, a tour. They've identified the gaps. They've identified the opportunities. And we've come together in a room and you know, discussed these opportunities and how to address them. And how each player, be it a public sector player, be it a private sector player, can come in and play their part. So this is an effort that is ongoing. Talk about tourism. Tourism, there are so many roads that are being constructed, about 700 uh, kilometers of tarmac road within just the Albert and Graben. And we know the, 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 the Albert and Graben is rich in um, the ecosystem. So those roads, apart from just supporting agriculture, which is a linkage, they also boost tourism. So that conversation also is ongoing with uh, the tourism sector. So those are the efforts that the PAU is currently uh, pushing. We are still having that conversation. Some linkages have been defined fully, okay, and what needs to be done has been uh, properly put on the, on the table, whereas other linkages are still undergoing a process of uh, definition. But those linkages still feed into the sectors that the NDP3 has really highlighted. Interesting. Um, we constantly hear value addition, value addition, industrialization, and so on. Where do you see the, f uh, or what support, uh, where do you see the youth, you know, uh, getting more support or being helped, you know, to be able to undertake, you know, this or participate actively in the value addition process and industrialization? I think my colleagues have touched on, you know, uh, Yes, those they areas. definitely have. Uh, the yes. efforts that are being uh, put in place. Stambik has clearly demonstrated yes. the intake, uh, that they, what, what they normally do, the trainings that they offer the youth. Uh, my colleague Ruth has also indicated what the uh, private sector has also is, is, is doing, essentially. And like I mentioned, uh, the IEC that government is also uh, setting up is meant to drive that agenda to help youth skill them and give them those um, opportunities. And I know uh, a lot is going to come, especially when it comes to industrialization, with the, with the refinery that we talked about, that, uh, that will also have another aspect, the Kabbalah Industrial Park. Okay, that is an, an, an industrial park for the petrochemicals. That is going to also drive industrialization. You have a lot more uh, industries that will be set up in that particular um, uh, infrastructure. And these are opportunities, you know, uh, that we're talking about. Definitely. Jobs will be there. Lots of products will be available. And the youth are the ones who actually take up these opportunities. We just need to look out for them. Search for this information. Like they say, um, information is the new gold. You need to just look out for this information. Right. Attend, you know, such engagements. Listen in to such en engagements. The supply development workshops that we talked about uh, that are quarterly done by the IOCs now have gone online because of COVID. So you can actually attend such an engagement, even when you're deep in Capella Bion, you know, 
as long as you have access to internet. So this, this, I think we used to need to look out for this information, dig it through, and take it in. Read a lot of uh, literature, especially about the regulation. It's very, very clear. Mm. Provides avenues how you can participate. And the rights that you as a Ugandan have, you know, wh what you really have. So that information is always there at our website, or even uh, the ministry website, and even on the internet. Right. Uh, so... Did you want to sub yeah, I wanted supplement? to just steal a minute and, and add on to, uh, to, uh, to what Power has um, explained. Mm -hmm. You see, the, the, I, I, I kept getting baffled. The other day I was in the supermarket and I, I, got, I bought honey. When I reached home, I realized it was actually from UAE. Honey from UAE. I, had, I wouldn't have bought if I knew it was uh, from, from Dubai. But then that is where the gap is. Why do we still have honey from Dubai flocking our market. Where are the young people who are innovating in this regard? Of course, there is a lot of honey. But the idea is, have you then gone a, a step forward and mm. gotten the support you need to certify from UNBS? If you do not have the certification, you cannot uh, comfortably sell on the market. So we need to stop the debate of you will stay informal. As my colleague already mentioned, there is just a cap and a limit where you will end. If we are going to grow these businesses, we must become formal, and the opportunities are here now. If you have that business idea, maybe you've uh, come from the innovation village, the, 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 the idea is uh, very innovative, and you need further training, come to the incubator, then apply for the, uh, for the UNDP uh, Innovative Innovation Challenge Fund. Or if you need, uh, as Wilson mentioned, uh, if you need to scale that, that, that product, the opportunity is there. But we need to stop thinking in the local way and learn that we must formalize to be able to compete favorably with other international players. Thank you. Samatha, you wanted to come in here. Yes, just to supplement on what uh, Joel is saying. Um, the Innovation Village has a sister company, Motive, which actually focuses on uh, products made by Ugandans. Uh, and shop.motive.org is where we get to then show those products and sell them. And Motive is essentially the biggest... Uh, you know, creative makerspace in East Africa, where you have creatives across different industries, be it, uh, you know, be it fashion, uh, clothing. Uh, uh, Ruth was just talking about how, you know, teachers lost their jobs. We actually got to, Motive got to employ a lot of these ladies to then uh, manufacture masks um, and actually got contracts from, from, you know, even the government of Uganda to produce masks and in itself, you know, creating employment opportunities uh, so really taking that, you know, and speaking to what, um, you know, each of these organizations is doing, which is really remarkable. Um, it's also good to, we, we also do think futuristic and, and, and not, um, you know, on what, you know, is, if it's youth skilling, but also what technology are youth and what innovative ideas are youth, you know, coming up with. Because if you look at some of these biggest, the biggest startups in the industry now, you know, if you look at Facebook or, you know, if we want to pick like the big names and you look at the founders, you know, mm -hmm. how old were they yeah. when, you know, when they came up with these ideas, mm -hmm. but most people didn't take them seriously. Most organizations didn't take them seriously, but now they're taking a lot of these big businesses out of business, right? And they're taking up the market. And I think that's what, you know, we also try to push is, you know, motive being the creative space and the innovation village being, you know, innovation and technology and how we can then all tap into that and create win-win uh, partnerships. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as we wind up, I'm going to ask each one of you, starting with Ruth mm -hmm. and coming all the way back, uh, to share with me your last comments, your parting comments, with, uh, to share with the audience your parting comments. Ruth, starting with you. I think what I need to say is that the opportunities for oil and gas are there for young people. But I always say that opportunities come to those that are ready for them. And I want to call upon the young people to make sure that they style up, they don't give up, they have the courage to go and learn, to go and upgrade their skills, to think through what they can be able to offer and go to any nearest business support institution to support them because the opportunities are there. And importantly, it's not even about what you studied, it's about what you can do and what kind of attitude and social skills that you have to be able to be employed by the sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilson, over to you. 
Yes. I think I want to build uh, from what Ruth has mentioned. The opportunities are available. And we have also, through the discussions, identified still a certain number of challenges. I think what we need to do is to create a better ecosystem, a better environment for the youth to be able to, to thrive in, this, in the oil and gas sector. And this will call for collective and coordinated partnerships within, uh, between various players and also taking an integrated approach uh, in uh, ensuring that we can deliver better. For you, can, you, you heard, for example, the value chain. We need to have this support that's going along the value chain. If you are going to talk about youth in mining, but there are other value chains in agriculture and other support that support that sector. So our coordinated approach should, should also ensure that we, we do it across the value chain. So integration, upscaling, and so we can facilitate the youth to be able to take advantage of all those opportunities. Mm. Thank you. Right, thanks. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I think to the youth out there, like I mentioned, information is the new gold. Uh, take time. Uh, dig through, look for this information. It's readily available. The PAU website has a lot of information on the oil and gas sector and the opportunities. Procurements are usually uh, uploaded on the PAU website. Look out for that information. And, and, and if there's anything you shouldn't forget from this discussion that we've had this uh, afternoon, is the National Supplier Database and the National Oil and Gas Talent Register. That is the gateway to oil and gas you know, participation. There are, those two systems are available on the PAU website, www.pau.go.ug. Uh, please register. If you have a business, register your business there. If you, um, you want uh, employment, please register there. We'll, you'll have um, visibility. And as PAU, we are readily available to help and support you. We have our offices uh, at Amber House and as well as Entebbe. It's a very open uh, office. We have a fully-fledged national content department and we'll be there to support you. Even for NSD, there's a, there's, 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 there's a team that is there 24-7 to support your registration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joel, over to you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Cynthia. Um, before I came here, I, I committed that uh, there's, that there's a quote I, I love to, to read, um, and it says that... Uh, you, do not, you should not allow to only be a product of the environment. You can make the environment a product of you. And I'd like to leave that with the audience. That it is possible as Ugandans, uh, at Stambik we say it can be. We should stop only producing for the small market and learn the process of producing for scale because that is the only way we will create jobs, building bigger businesses apart from Serve against copycatting, as we say. Chapati store, chapati store, chapati store. Can we then build better and stronger businesses? And the Stambic business incubator is here for you. It is your home of SMEs. Go to any branch, you will get supported, and you can uh, enroll in any of our programs and we shall support you on the process of becoming formal and then accessing either finance, markets, or any of the partnerships that we have. Again, at Stambic, we say, it can be. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Over to you, Samantha. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I think this, this panel here has really, has really tapped into all the opportunities that the youth can tap into. And there's also more futuristic opportunities. And there's a need to then, you know, strengthen collaborative initiatives where, um, you know, key stakeholders and entrepreneurs, youth, uh, can tap into, you know, leveraging technology and innovation to solve for challenges and then create, you know, stronger partnerships and greater efficiency in, in the processes in the oil and gas sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so there you've had it. We've had a very robust discussion and, uh, this, uh, you know, sharing what youth can do. And this is, I'll remind you, this is uh, the 90 days of oil and mining um, youth week in particular, this whole week is about Youth Week under the 90 Days of Oil and Mining that is run by Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. So I really love to thank you, Ruth uh, Beans Kamsoke from Private Sector Foundation, very, very much for your contribution uh, this afternoon. And uh, Mr. Wilson Kwamia, uh, who is the team leader, Inclusive uh, Green Growth, UNDP Uganda. Thank you so much for your contribution. 
Mr. Alex uh, Viamukama, the National Content Officer from uh, Petroleum Authority of Uganda. We are so grateful for the insights you've managed to share with us uh, today. And then, uh, of course, Joel Bamuise from uh, Stambik Business Incubator, and he's the program's manager. Joel, thank you so much for your contribution. We've really learned a lot from what you're doing. And then uh, you have Samatha Neon Saba. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Oh, wow. Perfect. Uh, from Innovation Village, and she's the future lab lead. So I would like to really thank Uganda Chamber of Mines and uh, Petroleum for making this possible. But they wouldn't have been able to do it without the support of several other uh, companies that have supported this sensitization drive. Like I mentioned, it's been ongoing for 90 days and is still on until the 26th of November. And in no particular order, I'd like to recognize the sponsors who include Total, Talo, uh, UNOC, Petro Petroleum Authority of Uganda, ICS, which is uh, Infra Consulting Services Limited, Uganda Insurers, uh, Insurers Association, Stambic Bank, ICO uh, Insurance Consor Consortium for Oil and Gas Uganda, Petrofac, Minet, PWC, that is PricewaterhouseCoopers, AGR, the African Gold uh, Refinery Limited, Bureau Veritas. We are so grateful for making it possible for us to share comprehensively how youth can actively participate in the oil and mining sector. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and we are grateful for the opportunity. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.